10,000. Let me kind of come full 360 degree circle, tell you what became of him. Tommy survived to the end of the war through Nansen's help. He was liberated on April 22nd. His mother survived in a different concentration camp, a camp called Ravensbrück, a woman's camp in Germany. His father did not survive. He died of pneumonia in January 1945 in Buchenwald, yet another concentration camp. And it would take Tommy and his mother another year and a half to find each other in war torn Europe. I mean, they didn't, even, Tommy had no idea where his mother had ended up. His mother had no idea where Tommy had ended up. But eventually they, they reunite, and that's another whole chapter. Find, uh, Tommy's mother finds him actually in an orphanage in Warsaw. She takes him back to Germany. That's where she had grown up. She takes him back there to raise him. Now you have to remember when Tommy is liberated in the spring of 1945, he is completely illiterate. He can't read, he can't write. He's never been in school in his entire life. And Nansen asks him one time, well, why don't your parents teach you how to read and write? I mean, you didn't have to go to school for that. And Tommy responds by explaining that in the ghetto where they lived together in Kielce, Poland, it was a capital crime for Jews to teach their children how to read and write. He says, my parents could have been shot for doing that. So this boy has had no education at all, formal or informal, other than how to stay alive. So his mother takes him back to Germany and she hires a tutor. She says to the tutor, I want you to teach my son in one year everything that he should have learned in grades one through seven. So at the end of that one year, I can put him in the eighth grade, which is the grade that he would have been in and should have been in if he had been going to school like a regular child. So Tommy has a year of tutoring. He enters the eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, starts the 11th grade. He's now a young teenager. And he's starting to think about his own life, his own future, and he decides he doesn't want to spend it in Germany for reasons I think we can all understand. So he decides to emigrate to the United States. And luckily for him, he has an aunt and uncle who live in Patterson, New Jersey. So he emigrates in January, 1951. When he arrives in America, his aunt and uncle take him down to the local high school in Patterson. They sign him up. Teacher says, okay, well, based on your age, young man, you're now a, a in the middle of your junior year at, at Patterson High School. And here's a kid who's been in school for three years, three and a half years total. He's only had English instruction for three and a half years. He didn't speak English before the war. So Tommy is in kind of this sink or swim environment. He finishes high school. He then goes to a small liberal arts college in West Virginia. And four years later, he graduates as a valedictorian of his class. He then goes to NYU Law School in New York, gets a legal degree. He then goes to Harvard Law School, gets a master's degree and a doctorate in the field of international law and international human rights. Inspired, he said, by the example of Ad Nansen. And Tom Bergenthal goes on to have one of the most spectacularly successful careers you can have. He wins every award, every accolade in the field. And that culminates in the year 2000 when he's appointed to the International Court of Justice at The Hague. And that's a picture of Tom Bergenthal in his judicial robes. Now, one of the most unexpected benefits of my working on Nonsense Diary and getting it back into print is I become a very close friend of Tom Bergenthal's in the process. Tom is now 85 years old. He lives just outside of Washington and Chevy Chase, Maryland. And before the coronavirus hit, every time I traveled through Washington, which was pretty frequently, I would visit with Tom, have dinner with him and his wife, Peggy. Delightful, delightful man. And this diary, when it was published back in 1947, Nansen dedicated it to young Tommy. In his dedication, he says, I dedicate this book to you, young Tommy, to your living memory, I dedicate this book. And Tom Bergenthal has kind of repaid the favor by writing the preface to this new diary, to this new ver version edition of the diary. So I'd like to wrap this up by reading you one final diary entry. I know I'm running a little bit late here. To me, this diary entry kind of sums up or encapsulates everything I've tried to talk about. The date of it is March 5th, 1945. And Nansen goes to Tommy and he says, Tommy, I've got some bad news. In fact, this is the hardest thing I've had to do in my three and a half years as prisoner. I've just learned that I'm gonna be moved from Sachsenhausen to another concentration camp, a camp called Neuengamme. And I'm gonna be leaving you behind. There's no way I can take you with me. I thought of every possible way to smuggle you into that camp with me so I can keep an eye on you, but I can't. So you have to promise me 
that you'll write to me after the war, tell me how you made out. And Tommy responds by saying, yes, yes, of course I'll do that. After all, I consider it my duty. And Nansen is struck by the fact that Tommy uses this word duty. I mean, after all, he's still talking to a 10-year-old child at this point, but Tom probably thought it was a grown-up, mature word to use in this context. This is what Nansen writes. Now, remember, when I'm reading these words, when Nansen writes his diary entry on March 5th, he doesn't know the war is about to end, that it's going to end in eight weeks. Again, he's kind of given up wondering when it'll ever end. He doesn't know whether he'll survive to the end of the war. He doesn't know whether Tommy will survive to the end of the war. He doesn't know whether he'll continue to get the food parcels at this point, given the fact that the Allies are bombing everything. And yet, just listen how hopeful and how compassionate, how eloquent this diary entry is. And knowing what we know about what ultimately became of Tom and his career, how prophetic these words turn out to be. And this is what he writes. Little Tommy, if only your fellow creatures thought a fraction as much about their duty to you as you do about yours to them, all your prospects would be brighter than they are today. Thank God you don't realize that. And may you never come to realize the abyss of vile injustice that has been done to you. May there be such a future in store for you that all this frightful, this unintelligible cruelty will be expunged from your mind. May you discover that life is not like that. The world is not as it looked to you from the floor of the cattle car when you cried because you were so terribly told. May you one day grasp and experience its richness in all the warmth and joy all the beaming light that are reflected in those big eyes of yours, too shrewd for a child's, in which are a reminder and evidence of what you are meant to be. So that is the end of my presentation about Odd Nansen and his diary. I'd be happy to answer any and all questions that you have, as well as any feedback you have on this presentation. This is the only the second successful virtual presentation that I've made. Um, I don't count the, the one I dictated over the phone to you before about Fritjof Nansen. Um, I've listed here my website as well as my email. You can go to my website if you're interested in signing up for my blogs. All you have to do is put your name and your email address and I will sign you up. Every time I write a blog, you'll get a notification by email. As I say, I'm going to publish one on the 27th, which will mark the 93rd wedding anniversary of, of Odd Nansen. I'll be talking about his wife, Kari. And I write about subjects dealing with Nansen, with the war, with Norway, or anything else that kind of strikes me as being something readers might be interested in. You can also, on my website, go to, there's a little button on the home page, and you can purchase a copy of, of the diary if you're so interested. I'd be happy to sign it for you. I'd be happy to inscribe it for you. If you want to send it to somebody else, just send me their address. I don't charge um, sales tax. I don't charge any shipping fees. The book itself costs $39.95. And I should point out to you, I make no money from the sale of the book. I give away 100% of the royalties to two charities. 50% go to the Holocaust Museum in DC. 50% go to the Center for the Study of the Holocaust in Oslo. When I was doing my research, I learned that when Fritjof Nansen won the Nobel Peace Prize, he got a cash award, as all Nobel laureates do. And he used that money to build experimental farms in the Soviet Union to help prevent another famine, which he had worked on while he was uh, working for the League of Nations in 1920, 1922. I also learned that when Odd Nansen's diary was translated into German, he gave away the royalties for the German translation to German refugees. And here's a man who's been brutalized by the Nazis for three and a half years, but he said the German people needed the aid to recover more than I do. And if we do not break the cycle of hate in Germany by rehabilitating the country, we'll be fighting them all over again. So I felt that if I could ever find a publisher, that I could do no less than follow their examples and give away the royalties. I mean, after all, morally, this book is not my book. It's nonsense book. So I shouldn't be profiting from it anyways. And thus far, in the four years that the book has been in circulation, 
I've donated over $15,000 now total to those two organizations. Mm -hmm. So I'm not doing this for myself. All I want more than anything else in the world is for people to read this book and to find out what an amazing man